My presentation today is about uh, individual I think is extremely important in the history of Davenport and the Quad Cities. This is Charles A. Ficka, uh, the man and his mansion. C.A. Ficka was proud of his German background and his American life in Davenport, Iowa. He also believed in the community of Davenport, which accepted German Iowan diversity. And looking at his life and times, there were many facets to it. Uh, and with the vibrant Davenport institutions, he infused them with energy, with vision, and they are still central to Eastern Iowa culture. Today, um, uh, I'll describe his early life and, and career. And then I wanna go on to identify three uh, major money streams, which gave him, gave him great wealth, and then point to his vision of giving back to his city and region. It's Ralph uh, Waldo Emerson in his famous essay entitled Nature, who wrote, quote, every spirit makes its house and we can give a shrewd guess from the house to the inhabitant. This is the house that he spent the last 40 years of his life. And it's a house that in many ways reflects uh, those important uh, aspects. Oftentimes um, I've considered him primarily from his book collecting uh, and how that led to the beginnings of special collections, the Davenport Public Library. He was certainly involved in a number of other things uh, and Around the turn of the century, uh, a book of cartoons uh, came out uh, in 1913. And here is the one uh, for Charles A. Thicke. Uh, and from the cartoon, what it's showing, the fact is that he was a world traveler and eventually he started his own uh, travel agency uh, managed by a cousin. Um, the idea in looking at this is to start out and describe his early years and see how they led to what many people would consider success. This is a late photograph from the 1920s, a few years before he died. Because in the very beginning, he was born in Germany, Northern Germany, in the town of Weizenberg, right on the border with uh, the Duchy of Schleswig-Holstein, uh, one known by many Davenporters who worked out their ancestry. He migrated with his parents and siblings arriving in New York City on April 15th, 1852. They took steamships on the Great Lakes and landed in Chicago, eventually moving to the Southwest, settling on a 280 acre farm, a few miles Northeast of Long Grove, a farm which had timber, access to the Wapsipinicon River, and seemed to be perfect. His earlier, earliest memories, which he wrote about later on, were of the vast prairies, the abundant prairie chickens, which he loved to chase as a boy, and the prairie fires, fires in the fall and October, uh, lighting up the evening sky, and then sometimes during the daytime, watching millions of passenger pigeons darkening the sky. As a young boy, he learned that there was anti-German prejudice in the 1850s in Iowa, but this disappeared in 1861 when thousands of recent German uh, immigrants volunteered for Lincoln's call for 90-day volunteer soldier citizens. There were others who volunteered but stayed home. His older brother, Herman, was elected captain of the locally organized Home Guard and the prejudice began to disappear. In the fall of 1863, as a young teenager, he was apprenticed to uh, a store in Loudoun, and for a year, he learned the business of selling things to farmers, um, grain, uh, lumber, butter, and of course, dressed hogs. Uh, but these were not the kind of pigs and skirts and funny hats. Uh, this was uh, food for the winter. He had been tutored instead of attending the district school. And by the fall of 1864, 
he decided that he needed to become much more fluent in English. It would help his business practices. So he moved by himself to Davenport, boarded at the Keystone Hotel, and at age 14, attended grammar school at six or more. Now, the principal at the time was famous uh, Phoebe Sudlow. He was promoted twice and received his certificate to enter high school in a year, uh, the fall of 1865. At this time, his dream was to enter Griswold College uh, on Main Street, on College Square, and eventually receive a bachelor's degree. But that summer, he worked on a farm, and he changed his mind and became a dry goods salesman at Davenport, working at three different shops. At the same time, um, he was able to uh, live at home because his father sold the farm and moved his family uh, where he opened the grocery store. He did study at Bryan and Stratton's Commercial College, and he was hired at the insurance firm of Hartwell and Smith, finally obtaining a position at the Davenport National Bank from 1870 to 1876. This is kind of the critical period in his life. It was during this time that he and other clerks uh, would discuss their future, uh, and he began to read law with Hans Reimer Clausen, the Dean of German Lawyers. This, of course, was an option. You didn't need to go to law school. You simply read with a practitioner. And he and Clausen would discuss his previous week's reading for about two hours every Sunday morning. And at the same time, he was being tutored in Latin. He saved his money during those six years, and because another successful lawyer, Edward Cook, had graduated from the New York School of Law in Albany, C.A. first of all toured the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia and then entered this law school in the fall of 1876. Upon graduation, he spent four months on his first tour of Europe. From his memoir, Four Score Years, he wrote, I wanted to cover the widest possible field since I might never uh, visit Europe again. He spent a week in London, then Paris, and spent a month in Italy, finally ending up in Germany, where he revisited his town of birth. When he returned, he rented an attorney's office, lived with his parents and sisters. His father had retired by this time and purchased a house at 504 West 11th Street near the German side, west side of Davenport. His legal practice quickly grew and this became the basis of his first money stream. He was the most successful and sought after German American lawyer in Eastern Europe. He became the regional Deutsche Advocate, speaking three languages, high German, low German, and English. He was in demand uh, with farmers in Scott County. And it was helpful to have his eight siblings living in rural Scott County. He was equally accepted by American lawyers, and thus he was much like John Hallberg in Rock Island County. This was enhanced when he moved into politics and was elected a city attorney, 1886 through 1890, then mayor, 1891, through 1893. During his period of public service, he devised a second money stream, which was quite legal at the time. He became a loan agent based upon his earlier experience of working at a bank. And for the rest of his career, he publicly focused and favored his preferred 3% interest rate to loan farmers and others money. Meanwhile, um, he had been elected president of Central Turners in downtown Davenport at the age of 31. He purchased a house uh, near to Immaculate Conception Catholic Academy on the Central Bluffs of Main Street, and he met Fanny Davison, whom he married on March 23, 1882, in the front parlor of her parents' home. This was truly a mixed marriage time. 
since Main Street was a sort of dividing line between German and American communities, his background was German and hers was American. And during the decade of the 1880s, uh, they raised a family um, with two daughters, Alice and Helene, and a son, Arthur Davison Dickey, um, who would become a very famous poet and interpreter of Japanese prints, uh, which is actually still in print. And um, it uh, is a kind of uh, art that's interesting. With, with Halloween coming up, I included this one, which was uh, shown at an earlier uh, contemporary club meeting. Um, it's interesting because going back to his marriage in 1882 in March, uh, in July, his father died at age 75. Later on in the decade, um, Fanny joined the Tuesday Club, uh, ladies uh, essay club at the time, and the family uh, was doing very well. During this time, Ficka expanded into a third money stream, real estate. He had accumulated capital and he systematically started buying various blocks in downtown Davenport, which offered potential development. He consolidated these blocks with adjacent properties into 40 distinct parcels, and then he rehabbed or replaced the commercial buildings, thus creating for himself and his uh, firm uh, an internal cycle of recapitalization paid for by improved properties with higher rents. In 1881, uh, he and Fanny watched a few blocks away as the old Thorington house was torn down. U.S. Congressman James Thorington, 1854-1856, had been mayor of Davenport in the 1840s and Scott County Sheriff during the Civil War. And as they watched slowly, an architectural gem was being erected on this land and completed in 1884. This is now called the Thicke Mansion, but in 1884, it's James Monroe Parker who actually uh, spent the money to build it and could because he was financially very successful. Um, Parker um, came from a large family originally from Vermont, but he moved here in the 1830s, and it was his sister who had married James Thorington. So at least the land stayed in the family. That house is a classic Second Empire mansion that originated in France and incorporates uh, many Baroque elements, elements. Parker was a successful banker and speculator who had survived the 1857 panic. Um, he started out as a, a clerk, eventually rising uh, to a partner position in the city's first bank of cook and sergeant. He became semi-retired, uh, enjoyed his wealth, and died of a stroke in 1892. And Ficka purchased the mansion in 1893. The um, the house is, is very interesting, uh, particularly when we try to consider what we know about the career and the life and times uh, of Thicke. It's located in the Hilltop neighborhood, College Square, and in many ways, I believe that Thicke was making a statement by buying a mansion from a famous banker who had, was named after the fifth president of the United States. Um, it was, um, designed by Benjamin J. Cartside, a very well-known local architect, built by T.W. McClellan, and featured a slate roof designed by Victor Hue, another prominent local architect. It is reportedly mentioned that he paid $100,000 to build this mansion. Now, if you work out an equivalency, this means in today's dollar, it costs $3.7 million 
the bill. And it's located, of course, nowadays across from Central High School, uh, also across the street from Trinity Episcopal Cathedral, and was the site of the former Griswold College. And this was where Fitton lived for 40 years. It was built of brick and limestone with 12 and a half foot high ceilings. There were 38 rooms. Upon entering uh, on the left uh, into the front, on the front porch, uh, very stylish uh, Corinthian columns, and the front doors had stained glass windows. And those stained glass windows set much of the tone. Um, when you entered the full vestibule and moved forward, it was the beginning of a 44 foot long hallway to the rear. To the right um, are three huge doors with two of them opening to a formal front parlor, usually used for receptions. One passed by an elaborate sideboard and you could find eight ornate fireplaces in the house uh, and uh, plaster ceiling medallions hung um, with the original what were called gasoliers or chandeliers made to be lit with gas. Uh, quite a immense house on the inside also. This is from uh, a newspaper article. Um, in the basement, there were 10 rooms uh, used for a number of things. The left-hand corner is a photograph of what was of preeminent interest, a, a major a wine cellar. Also down in the basement, what we might call primitive uh, air conditioning, much like the John Deere mansion in Moline, the ducks would take cooler air from the basement and it would go through the house. Um, on the third, on the second floor um, were bedrooms, and on the third floor was where he had his private study. Uh, this is where he hung his Mexican paintings. This is where he had handmade special bookcases cases for his rare books. And by looking at the layout of the plan, we can sort of see that this was a, a interestingly designed house. Uh, there were some uh, certain luxe items, um, a dumb waiter for the dining room. Um, there was also wrought iron roof fencing decorative and uh, fanciful, fanciful wind moldings. Becoming a college student at Griswold College had been his dream in the mid 1860s. 30 years later, he had arrived. And it's not hard to see the vision of Charles A. Ficka nearly a century after his death. If you start walking in downtown Davenport, some of the properties, uh, commercial buildings are, still exist, but passing the Biggie Museum of Art, you can visualize what started out as the Davenport Municipal Art Gallery in 1922. It's CA donating his personal collection of colonial Mexican paintings to create the first free municipal art gallery in Iowa. You can walk a few blocks up on Main Street and you see the modern Edward Durrell stone designed Davenport Public Library, which contains in its basement its special collections. Special collections really started when CA contributed more than 100 rare books to be the core collection. You can drive a few miles north and west of Fedgeberry Park, where you will find the Putnam Museum, which began as the Davenport Academy of Sciences which Vicky was a supporter and later donated valuable relics from Egypt in the Far East. And you can drive east to Main Street and consider the community achievements of an influential German Iowa. Thank you very much.